I'm so happy to see everyone here at the Father's House. Thanks for coming out. We're launching a brand new series called Bless This Mess. And I wanted to start out right here in this kind of living room setting here because this is where that blessing goes. I don't know if you guys know, but Ryan was leading us in that song that's straight out of number six where God calls his people to speak that blessing over the people of God. May the Lord bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you and give you peace. Guess where we need the blessing? Oh, of course it's wonderful to have it right here in church. But how many of us desperately want a blessing outside of these doors? Can I hear an amen, amen. this morning, right? And, and, and that's exactly where God has called us to bring it. We're calling it a bless this mess because our God is not afraid of the mess, but this is in wisdom where we need it, where we wake where we work and where we worship, and though I wish my house always looked nice and neat and tidy, with five boys, and it's in, it's in a perpetual state of managed chaos. And I don't know if you guys have this in your house, but when we know someone is coming over, all of a sudden we go into panic cleanup mode, right? And we're just shoving things, places, hiding things under the rug, opening drawers and putting things in there, right? And so that when people come in, it's like, of course the house looks like this all the time, right? We have five million pillows on our couch, and for some reason they're all nicely rode up. You know, they're all just looking super, super good. And, and though it's, of course, there's nothing wrong with doing that for company, here's the truth. God doesn't want us to do that for him. He wants us to be very, very honest with him. That life is messy. He's not afraid of the mess. In fact, he wants us to invite him right into the middle of it. Just think about your, your home life right now. Your marriage. Your kids. Think about school. Think about work. Think about all of your plans. There's a lot of areas where we need God to bless our mess. And that's really what this whole series is about for the next uh, couple of weeks. We're going to be looking at situations where you and I can sit down with God and just have a conversation with Him, really honest, really transparent, and say, God, things are pretty messed up right now. And I am really needing your direction. I am really needing your help. Anyone need some direction from the Lord right now? Yeah, yeah, me too. Anyone need some help from the Almighty God in some areas in your life? Yeah, me too. So I'm glad you're here. Those joining us online, I'm glad you're joining us online because God has something for us and He wants to show us, first and foremost, the message is in the mess. Not only is He not afraid of the mess, but our God is able to walk into all of our situations and actually show us something amazing that He's going to bring out of it. The message is in the mess. If you want to follow along, you can either follow along on our Father's House app, or you can grab one of these paper notes that are on any of the tables around you. And we're going to start off in James 2. I want to share something with you as we kick this off that I've never seen before. I love James. It's a book of action. But I never saw this before until I saw it in this context here. James 2, 20-26. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called a friend of God. So he's, of course, James, is, he's got his audience, his attention. Everyone knows Abraham is the father of the faith. And so he's going right, right for what's going to, everyone's going to be like, this is the pinnacle. This is the example. This is the faith that we all want to eventually grow up to, or at least try to work towards, that Abraham believed that God would resurrect his son Isaac. And so he was willing to lay his life down because he believed God had given him a son of promise. And so that was a faith act if there ever was one. He's got everyone's attention that's reading this letter. But it doesn't stop at Abraham. Really interesting. Look with me. So you see, we're shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. And then verse 25, he just, just slaps everybody upside the head. This is like a total whiplash moment for the crowd because no one saw this. So you can imagine the person reading the letter to the church going, wait, wait, what? what? Rahab, the prostitute, is another example. I mean... He could have gone with any number of other examples of faith and action. There's David. There's Moses. There's any number of the prophets. 
But he goes right here. So you see, here's another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. I want you guys to catch the context here. In case you're not familiar with that story, most are familiar with Abraham and Isaac. What's going on here? When God called his people into the promised land and Joshua was leading his people, he sent some spies into Jericho, the first city that God wanted to take down. And those spies came to Rahab's house and she was, as said here, a prostitute. She was a woman of the night. This was her job description. And these guys came here, unlike all the other guys that came to her house, these guys came there because God had led them to her house. And somewhere along the way, when she heard the stories about how God had, had opened up the Jordan so the people could cross through, she came to her own faith and believing and knowledge. So when these guys, these spies knock at the door, it's a confirmation to her heart that this is the one true living God. And she welcomes them in, she hides them, and she says, I'm going to be your key to taking this town down. Now that's a, it's an amazing story in and of itself, but nowhere, nowhere did anyone see this coming when James is given the ultimate examples. I mean, I just want you to understand where this is on the spectrum. You, if you got Abraham right here, right, the pinnacle of the, and then you've got Rahab on, on the other side, it would be like, um, well, it would be like, you know, you got Mother Teresa, Right? We all, we all want to be like Mother Teresa, that kind of servant heart, that faith lived out to love. So you got Mother T on one end and you've got like Cardi B on the other end. It's like you, you just can't get more extreme than what James was doing. You guys understand what I'm saying, right? It took everybody by surprise. And why do you think James did that? Because he wanted us to know the messages in the mess. That if you have faith, you put it into action. You cannot be disqualified by your past. Because God is calling you to your future. And faith in action is for everyone. It's simple. You guys, we just tend to do it. We put ourselves on spiritual echelons. And we go, God would definitely use an Abraham person. And then there's people in the middle. And then there's the Rahab person. I, I know, I'm sure God could use her somehow. And so James smashes those together and goes, guess what God is looking for? He's not looking at your past. He's not looking at how, how righteous or unrighteous you were. He's looking for your faith in action. He is seeing the message in the mess. He is seeing that you are not qualified by your past, but by his presence in your life. By putting that faith into action, just like Abraham, just like Rahab, God has called each of us to see the message in the mess. So it'd be easy for you guys to look at a, an amazing worship leader like Ryan Rainey and go, God could never use me to do that. But Ryan would be the first one to say, you have the same spirit inside of you that he has in him, right, Ryan? Yeah. That God has anointed you to lead worship right where there. Maybe you don't need to know how to play the keyboard, but he has called you to lead worship in your home where you work. That's a place where you can invite the presence of God right into the middle of that mess. And God has called all of us to that. So let's, let's just kind of get rid of the, the spiritual echelons, the idea of comparing ourselves with each other. James says Abraham and Rahab are together before God because both of them put faith into action. So how do we do this? Moving forward, we're going to see a God who cleans up our mess in every area of our lives. But in the middle of the mess, we have to make sure, first and foremost, we refuse to reject the rejected. You can feel that in your notes. We refuse to reject the rejected. It's easy to do. We live in a cancel culture right now. Or if you say something that someone doesn't agree with, boom, cancel, done, out, cut it off relationship. I won't have anything to do with you. And yet our God could have done that with Rahab. But instead he said, no, here's a woman that's going to help me. See, my purpose is fulfilled. And that's how God sees you. I hope by the end of our message, you see yourself that way too. If God refused to reject us, even while we were still sinners, he died for us, how much more so can we do the same? He refused to reject the rejected. Hebrews 11, 30-31. If you're familiar with Scripture, you know Hebrews 11 is the hall of faith, right? 
That's where all the luminaries of Scripture, they are all listed. And yet, who do we see again? We see verse 30, it says, It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days, and the walls came crashing down. It was by faith that, here we go again, Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. You guys realize that Israel was a rejected people. They were the smallest people in the land. They had nothing to offer. They were considered completely insignificant. And God saw Israel and saw them as his chosen people. Why? Simply because he chose them. They were now special. They were now set apart. And so it's easy for us because we read all the stories of Israel. It's easy for us to forget that Israel was nothing. But God chose them. He saw them, made them the apple of his eye. And then right after a rejected people that he used to take down uh, the evil on the land, he then lists, there it is again, Rahab the prostitute. You see, our God loves to reach those that everyone else passes by. He loves to see the message in the mess. He loves to confuse the wise by raising up those that everyone else would consider foolish. You guys remember Zacchaeus, right? Remember Zacchaeus, Jesus is walking along, and Zacchaeus is a hated tax collector. Everyone hates him. The Jews hate him. The Romans hate him. No one likes him. He climbs up into a tree just to get a look at Jesus. And in Luke chapter 19, Jesus is walking by. The crowds are all pressing in him. But he sees up in the tree, and he calls Zacchaeus by name. He says, I'm going over to your house. When? Right now. He saw the message in the mess. Zacchaeus never had anybody that wanted to go over to his house because everyone hated his guts. And even the people were offended, like, why does Jesus even know what this guy is? Of course he did. And salvation came to Zacchaeus' house that day, right into the middle of the mess. And you know what Jesus said? For the Son of Man came to seek and save the cool. The Son of Man came to seek and save the accomplished. The Son of Man came to seek and save those with an excellent reputation, those who voted for the right political party. No, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That is Rahab. That is Israel. That is Zacchaeus. That is us. And that word lost there in the Greek, it literally means the destroyed one. He came to seek and save the destroyed ones. He came to get this picture. It's the picture of a beautiful piece of pottery that is dropped onto a hard floor and shattered into a million pieces. Our God came to save the soul shattered into a million pieces by their sin, by their shame, by their loss, by abuse, by hurt, by pain, by injustice. That's the ones our Jesus came to save. He doesn't only not, he doesn't only not reject the rejected. He actually calls them by name and uses them to reach others in his name. Are you feeling shattered? Are you feeling broken? Are you feeling scarred? Then he's come for you. And if that's the reason why we're singing today, because our God saw something that no one else saw, he saw the treasure in the trash, then you and I, we have been given a ministry that's as clear as it could possibly be, that we would see the message in the mess of others. It's weird. We have a lot of people around us that are totally messed up. And I wouldn't plan on saying this, but let me just say this really clearly. If you think everyone else is messed up and you're the only one that's got it together, can I just ask you to invite the Holy Spirit into that place? Because when the Holy Spirit's invited into that place, He's going to begin to show you some things we need to repent. Some things that we need to clean up. If nothing else, he's going to remind you of what you were saved from. The one who has forgiven much, loves much. That's why we as a people, church, Father's house, we refuse to reject the rejected. We make room in this room and in every room where you and I are going to spend our time. We make room for those who feel there is no room for them in the church. Who feel that there is no room for them in God's presence. Who feel like you've heard all heard it before from friends and family who've tried to invite the church. If I step into that place, I get struck by lightning, right? Haven't we all heard that? We want to be a church where they know, no, when you step into this place, you're going to get struck by the love of God. Amen. Who's going to completely embrace you. Because our God comes to the lost. He comes for the shattered. He heals the broken. And he sees the 
message in the mess. I remember we did, um, our, we have one of our father's houses in Oahu, and Nanette Pelletier, she has such a heart for the homeless. And when we were there pastoring on Oahu, she led us in multiple outreaches. And we did this outreach on the 4th of July, where we, we made up like 1,500 hot dogs and hamburgers, and we brought them out. There was a lot, lot of homeless vets on Oahu, on the Oahu streets. And we had someone that was serving in the military, Tom Matelski, and he came up, and before we went out with all of our hot meals, he, he looked us all in the eyes and he said, I need you guys to do something. And we were all told to write a letter to these homeless vets, thanking them for what it is that they've done. In our own handwriting, handing it to them, he said, they need to know that they are seen. And they need to hear that you are thankful for what it is that they've done for the country. He said, I want you to tell all of these homeless vets that are there that they've accomplished more than most people ever will. Because they need to be reminded of that. I want you to thank these homeless vets that you see. Thank you for laying down your life for people that don't even know you're alive. And because of all of the stuff that they went through, all of the PTSD, all of the things that they saw, many of those are the reasons why they ended up on the streets in the first place, because they laid down their lives for us. I'm telling you, when, when God calls us to refuse to reject the rejected, He reminds us, first of all, that we were once rejected, but He saw us in our sin. And then when we went out there and we handed these meals to the people and we prayed with these, these vets, you could just see that this was probably the first time in their lives that anyone saw them as more than just a reject, as more than just hopeless, or more than just defined by the smell or their, the location of their cardboard box. And it's not just with the homeless. It's even with people that are super well-dressed, well-appointed, have great positions, great jobs, nice homes. They need to be reminded because on the inside, they're falling apart. They need to be reminded that God has not rejected them. How do we remind them that? Three eyes: identify, identity, invitation. Identify with them. Just like we were asked to do with the homeless, identify with them because all of us have been at a low place. All of us have been in a place where we felt rejected and we felt alone, facing things on our own. Even if you've never been homeless, all of us have been in a place where we have need that we cannot meet. Identify them. Don't pretend like we are somehow higher or greater than they are simply because of their current position in life. Identify with them. Secondly, identity. Let them know that, that you're not calling them names, but Jesus is calling them by name. Just like Zacchaeus out of that tree, out of his shame, out of his sin, coming for the lost, that you and I would show them their identity isn't in their past or their present situation, but because of what Jesus has done on the cross. And how do you and I do that? I'm telling you, when you and I are secure in our identity, we love being able to go after the rejected, after the lost, after the broken. Because God, that's what God did for us. Identify where they're at. Remind them that their identity is not defined by their past. And thirdly, invitation. Invite them into relationship. Let them know you're not a waste of time. No one's a waste of time. No one. And we're all super busy. But our God took time Cross time and space. Take on our skin and our sin and our shame. Amen. To reach us right where we were at. In the midst of our mess, our stench of our sin. And to call us his home. Can we take time to do the same? Maybe it's obvious like someone who's living on the street. Maybe it's the not so obvious people that you work with. Maybe that you go to school with, your neighbors, your friends. But if you ask... Jesus to show you they're rejected. You get to remind them that they're accepted in the love of Jesus. And that's our community builder discussion question. How can you reach the rejected this week? How can you identify with where it is they're, they're at instead of judging them for where they're at? How can you remind them that their identity is not in their past, but in what Christ has done for them on the cross? How can you invite them into a relationship so that that homeless outreach was not just a one-off, but it was a beginning of a relationship with these homeless vets and what it is that God's called us to do. So we are a people who see the message of the mess. We are a people who refuse 
to reject the rejected. Secondly, we see the story and the scars. We see the story and the scars. All of us have them. Most of us hide them. God sees them. And those scars are stories of redemption. Help me understand this better. One of the privileges that I had when I was pastoring in Oahu was our church had planted a number of churches in Japan, the land of the rising sun. And I had the chance to be able to go there for a few years and minister to some church plants and, and pastors there. And I love Japan. I love the people there. And I just tried to learn as much as I could while I was there. And while I was there, I came across the aesthetic, Japanese aesthetic of wabi-sabi. Have you guys ever heard of that? Yeah, so I wanted to just share a quick clip of an interview that I did while I was over there in Japan. And you'll see what this has to do with seeing the message in the mess. Take a look at this. Aloha New Hope, I am here in Japan with my friend Will from New Hope Tokyo and we are here for the Ohana retreat that's going to start in a couple of days. But while I was here, Will, I wanted to discover the aesthetic of wabi-sabi. Mm -hmm. Not wasabi, which is of course essential when you're eating sushi. Uh -huh. But wabi-sabi is something that's kind of underneath the culture of Japan that maybe a lot of people aren't familiar with. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of help us understand for those of us that aren't familiar why wabi-sabi is so important to the Japanese culture? At its heart, wabi-sabi is uh, finding uh, the beauty in things that aren't necessarily what we might not consider to be complete mm. or uh, you know they may be broken or whatever but to find the uh, the beauty within that mm, mm, mm. and so where we would from an American mindset always look for perfection like my iPhone if it's got a scratch in it I'm buying the next mm. one or if someone dings my car then I'm, I'm gonna trade it in wabi-sabi is the idea of not always looking for perfection but actually understanding that imperfection there's a, there's a beauty in that right or to appreciate things for what they are mm. you know something might be old and to appreciate the history within that item and that it's not just uh, to be thrown away because it's old but um, to be appreciated for what it has gone through. All right, well, let's go ahead and interview uh, the shop owners and find out what it means to them. So we have been on the search for a wabi-sabi. I read about it in Hawaii and wanted to find out what it meant here in Japan, where it originated. And I heard that it had something to do with uh, perfection um, and imperfection. Where if I dropped this dish, which I won't do, but if I dropped this dish and I saw these cracks, I'd just throw it away. But you save, you save the dish. There are several ways to fix potteries. And it is possible to fix a pottery even when it is not broken. Especially in a pottery, we mend the broken part with lacquer and decorate it with gold or silver. It is because of our desire to treat things with love and care. And it means to bring it back to life again. And so where this one is, is what we would call perfect because it was not dropped. This one was dropped, but the value of uh, kintsu kintsugi? Kintsugi. kintsugi and wabi-sabi says this, is even, this one's actually more valuable because of its history and it was still, we can still use it. In the American mindset, uh, Im imperfection means it's not as good. And that's not just with dishes, that's even with people. People that have had a hard life, have had hurts or pains, a lot of times we just kind of put them off to the side. People, as they get older and more wrinkles around the eyes and the face, they aren't seen as 
beautiful anymore. But this idea says, no, the wrinkles are signs of a story of character of life that we should learn from and actually consider more beautiful than the person who is maybe perfect on their skin but hasn't really lived life yet. And uh, those that have experienced hurts or pains, instead of pushing them to the side, we should learn from them so that we can both not repeat the same mistakes or also learn how to love and be compassionate towards people. That's why I love that idea. I think it is the same with people too. It is common to say if they are young, they are beautiful. But the way people live their lives show in their wrinkles, and I think even laugh lines are meaningful. Craftsmen make each pottery by hand, and their fingerprints and the way their hands reflect their care and passion in each pottery as they make the pottery. Just like people, I think the potteries are here now. Thank you so much. You've really helped me understand it. Uh, it's beautiful. My hope is that I can take this same idea back to Hawaii, back to the United States, and help us understand that even though all of us are imperfect, there's beauty in the imperfection, and none of us should be thrown away. This is how Paul puts it, 2 Corinthians 4. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. He purposefully chooses the Rahabs and the Zacchaeus and the Israel. He purposefully goes after those that everyone else passes by. And he says, these are jars of clay, cracked pots. His firm purposes through fragile people, limitless power through unlikely receptacles, the light of Christ shining through each of the places where we have wounds and weaknesses, the source of heaven and the stuff of earth. Instead of being obsessed with having everything perfect, instead of making sure that when we walk into church, we've, we've got our Christian smile on and, and everything is fine and we can just pretend long enough to just get back home. God is saying, no, the message is actually in the mess. Don't hide it. Don't run from it. The story is in the scars. This is what our God is saying. I have chosen you to put my glory in you. And the light shines through the womb. The light shines through the weakness. His light shines, his glory is glorified in the places where you and I are weak and where we struggle. There shouldn't be any place where we are standing in judgment as if we were are over another. I mean, when you look at this, this cup, now I couldn't afford the real ones because they use gold and silver to line the cracks. Those are, were way more expensive. So this is a uh, kind of a facsimile of it. But you can see all of the places here where it's all uneven. And this would look like something that you would throw away. But in the wabi-sabi Japanese aesthetic, this is our God saying, no, every one of these scars is a story of redemption. Every one of these places is where I should have been trashed, but God saw a treasure. And our, our Jesus, our Savior, I'm telling you, he feels that way about us. You know how I know? Because when he decided to introduce himself through the first book of the New Testament, he didn't whitewash that thing. Oh no, he didn't scrub it clean. He didn't go for the perfect dish on the shelf. No, in fact, he showed us his family tree for all of its uh, deficiencies, all of its shortcomings, all of its ugliness. It's kind of like when you, you, when you cut a tree and you can see all the places where that tree has had to endure fire or drought. You can actually see it in the rings of the trees when you cut it. And our Savior introduces himself in Matthew 1 with a whole list of people starting from the genealogy of David leading uh, or Adam leading all the way to the birth of Jesus. And the ones he mentions in his family tree are ones that you and I would probably hide away from everybody. Those are the photo albums we don't show anybody, right? And he's like, no, I want you guys to take a look because the story is in the scars. Abraham, of course, he was a man of faith, but he also messed up. Twice he lied, putting his wife, Sarah, in some really uncomfortable situations. 
Judah and Tamar, not only did Judah sell his brother Joseph into slavery, but he also committed incest with Tamar, his family member. Salmon and Rahab, she was a she was a Moabitess. She was from Moabite. She wasn't from Israel. She was a result of the incest from Lot and his daughters. I know this is like uncomfortable stuff for me to even talk about. And Jesus literally puts it on display in his family tree. The first thing out of the gate after 400 years of silence, Matthew chapter 1, boom, whoa. Are you sure you want to tell people that? Yes, I am. Boaz and Ruth. She was the, I'm sorry, she was the Moabitess. And she was the one that came out of, out of the law, uh, lineage of Lot. And of course, Rahab was in prostitution. And David and Bathsheba, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. He murdered Uriah. And yet Jesus said, all of these are part of my family tree that led to his redemptive birth and saving the world. So I don't know what your family tree looks like. I'm betting it's better than Jesus. So here's what I see in that. If he's not ashamed of his, you shouldn't be ashamed of yours. If he can see a story in the scars and see how God could use all of those people that you and I would rather ignore or dismiss or pretend we're not related to, then I wonder if you and I could revisit our own scars and see them as stories of redemption. See, here's the truth. In their community builder discussion question, God will take our sins, but he won't take our scars. But that's the story that leads others back to the cross. Who can you share your story of redemption with this week? There's a beautiful thing about the Wabi Sabi aesthetic, and I learned from some of the Japanese pastors there. They said, do you know what kintsugi means? And they said it means in Japanese, golden repair because they use actual gold in the glue that glues these dishes back together. Do you know what arushi means? The glue? It means, literally, this is so amazing. I just love it when God does this, how he speaks through the cultures. It means beauty and grace. The glue that keeps us together both individually as, and as a people of God is nothing short of God's beauty, of God's grace, of his golden repair coming from heaven into the shards, into the sin, into the places of brokenness and pain. And he gathers up all the pieces and he, he begins to perform his golden repair. He's not going to re remove the scars because that's the story of his golden repair. You and I, we don't need to walk around pretending like we're prepackaged and pristine. We are not stained glass windows. We are broken glass that God has brought together for us to show his beauty to the world around us. If you want to make peace with your past, hand your pieces to Christ. If you want to be able to refuse to reject the rejected, remember all the places where you were rejected and our God accepted you. If you want to be able to see the story and the scars, be reminded of this one thing, that one day you and I are going to be in heaven. And there's only going to be one set of scars. His hands and his feet. So that for all of eternity, all of creation will be reminded that if he was not ashamed of his scars, he's not ashamed of his son. He's not ashamed of you. And if you know that, even if you don't believe that, even if you're not sure that applies to you, but if you can just take that by faith, then guess what? We bring him the pieces right now. We bring it to him and we lay it before him. Our God, we put it into his scarred hands. The hands that would run through with nails so that you and I could be made whole. He was broken. In fact, let's just do that right now. We're going to have a prayer team at the back wall there. So anytime uh, during this closing song, you can receive some prayer. But let's just go ahead and stand right now. And let's just go ahead and raise our hands to the heavens.